Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, we will try to do the express version of this talk in 30 minutes. Last time we did it in a half an entire half uh, hour and a half and run out of time. So I'm not sure how that will work, but we will do our best. So without any ado, um, let's get to business and let me introduce here myself first, right? Yeah, uh, I'm Baruch Sadogurski, a developer advocate with JFrog um, at JBaruch all over the internet pretty much, and I define myself as that. Uh, today is the third day of DevOps, a lot of parties, so it's been a hard week for me. I apologize for any uh, problems that, that might encounter. And here with me is the great Oleg Shalayev. Yep, my name is Oleg, and I work for Zero Turnaround as a developer advocate. And I'm also a co-leader of Virtual Jug. So you, if you haven't heard of that, Google. If you have, it's an amazing thing. Join that, and then congratulate me and thank me on Twitter for recommending it to you. And for actually doing that as well, right? That's okay. true. So thank you. I'll start with that. As being a speaker on this marvelous virtual Java user group, it's just great. Okay, so let's get to business, and today we're going to do kind of a face-off or um, a, a battle between a Gradle and Maven. Um, they are, of course, the two most popular uh, build tools in the Java ecosystem out there, and this is why we selected them. Uh, they have uh, a lot of similarities, and that's why it's so fine it's so fun to compare between them, but also a couple of different paradigms that we will highlight during today's talk. Uh, your job will be, of course, selecting the winner, and uh, in the end of this talk, you will just vote for either of them by applause, and whoever g wins gets um, nothing, I guess. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess we could switch places multiple times during this talk because both of us are pretty fluent with both of the tools, and um, to say uh, honestly, both of them have their advantages and disadvantages, and good things and bad things about it. Uh, we will try to show you some of the strong points of each one of them, and you will be the ones to judge. Um, so yes, I guess we can start. And uh, we will start with um, a kind of an overview of, uh, of the project, and uh, I guess I can start Maybe we can just uh, tell you a couple of words about why we do we care about build oh, yeah, tools yeah, at all. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so absolutely. in a sense, a build tool is something that you run like frequently to just build your project and combine the artifacts of your daily work into some sort of archive that you can distribute somewhere or deploy to production or you work, run your tests against that. But basically what it does, it takes the source files and crunches them and then produces something else for you that you can use uh, later. Right, and uh, there are a number of non-functional requirements for uh, for a build tool. So first, we want, would like our builds to be fast, so we don't spend time waiting for that crunching to ha happen, especially if you do that multiple times a day. Second, we would like to have the builds reproducible because it's a, really not a very uh, great moment when we you run a build once and it kind of works in your machine and then your continuous integration system runs the build and it doesn't produce the same artifact. Uh, so consistency is always welcome, right? Uh, just to limit the complexity. What else? Uh, yep, so re reusability. Reusability, we would like to our configuration for the build tools to be reusable among different projects or different subparts of a single project so when you introduce a new, I don't know, module or some component of your system, you would configure that with minimal efforts. And here, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about, about Maven in this regard, because um, I believe that, although I represent Gradle here, I'll start by saying a couple of new words about, uh, nice words about Maven. And one of the rev uh, revolutionary aspects of Maven when it uh, came uh, to, uh, to be uh, what it is now and became popular was this f reusability thing, right? And think about it, whenever you start a new project, and I see here a lot of faces that I know from my personal uh, acquaintance with them, that they switch projects f fairly fast enough and, and uh, frequently enough and get into new projects every time. If the project is built with Maven, you know exactly what's going on. 
you know how the, how the project is structured, you know what the modules are, you know where to look for your sources, you know what to expect, right? So this is what do we mean in terms of uh, reusability as well. Um, this is our project, and if you are familiar with Maven, you will know exactly what's going on, right? So, ah, uh, presentation mode. Let's look at the code. So we have a multi-module project defined. Uh, it has uh, three modules, API, WAR, and library, and there are, the internal structure of that is that the WAR module depends on the library, and the lib module depends on the API and all three are built together, and then they're somehow packaged. And what we're looking at now is what Maven calls a reactor, right? What does uh, that mean? So the reactor is the synonym for the multi-module project, and Maven, in, in Maven, you can build modules into a hierarchy, and, and the reactor is the, what, how Maven will look at all those modules individually and create a way of building them independently of each other. Considering all the dependencies, considering that some modules could depend on other modules, and so it will look at all that picture, sort it into the order in which it can build it efficiently, and then uh, start building module per module. Obviously, for every module and for the parent, uh, for the reactor, you have to specify the configuration for the Maven in a POM XML file, which is an XML file that looks a little bit like that. Uh, Just much more of it. Uh, yeah, so for this simple project, it's like 60 lines of uh, XML. Yeah, that's nothing. Uh, and yeah, and if we're a project where there are like five lines of Java code, uh, one could consider this a little bit verbose. At the, no, same time, no. at, the, at the same time, if you looked with XMLs before, you know that a couple thousand lines of XML is nothing if you have proper tooling and a little bit of patience. Saying that, I heard about this new thing in XML called XML attributes. Um, good point. All right. Um, what is this parent tag that we see right here? So uh, the parent tag, when you have multi, multiple modules, you can specify for all of them which project is a parent, and then you will reuse part of the configuration of that uh, parent project. So uh, you can specify common functionality and common configuration for all your sub-modules in, in, the, in the parent and make all of them depend and say, I would like to extend from that parent project. So for example, you can have uh, properties defined for all the projects like an encoding or, I don't know, your uh, Java platform uh, JDK version that you would like to build or some common things like repositories. So Maven is not just a build, well, it is a build tool, but it also manages the dependencies for you so you can specify where from to pull the jar files to use in, in your local build. Uh, in a POM file, you just specify that with, oh, let me just show. Uh, I would like to have a dependency, and I would like that to be available for me at a certain time of the compilation, and you specify the unique identifier of that dependency and which version. And somehow when you start the tool, the Maven will take care of downloading half the internet and putting that into uh, the reach of your compilation process. All right, so um, let's look how it looks in Gradle. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a lot of similarities and, and for example, the built, the, the, the directory structure of the project looks exactly the same, something that we um, know from Maven, like source, main, Java, and then a test Java and, and this part. And we have, again, the same modules, API, lib, and war. So the, difference, the differences are that, for example, you don't have to have a project descriptor file in every directory. You will only put them in the directories when you actually have something to add, in the, in the modules that you have something to add. So what we have instead is a file that is called um, settings.gradle, which includes the list of all the sub-projects or sub-modules of this project, and then Gradle will know that it needs to build API, lib, and war, even if they don't have a Gradle script file inside. And, and the API is an example of that. So you see here an API, it doesn't have a Gradle script, but it is a Gradle project. And the others that we might want to add additional stuff to can definitely have this build.gradle, and here is an example of lib that defines a project dependency to an API 
and, uh, and, and the dependency to some third party stuff. Now, this project dependency is different from a third party dependency because it's actually established these intermodule dependencies, a little bit like you did in your reactor. And the good thing about it is that it means that it's dependency on the source level. Um, it, does, uh, it doesn't have to be an artifact in a repository in order to consume it, right? It's exactly uh, like, uh, like the reactor does. And um, here is an example of the war file. And again, we say here that it depends on lib. Now, the interesting part about the war uh, file is that it does not declare that it is a war file. So where it comes from, the top level build Gradle has the ability to, imply pl to apply plugins to a sub modules as well. So you can see here that from the parent build Gradle, we say that the war project is actually a war file, right? And here you have the flexibility to decide how you prefer it. This line could definitely go into a war build or Gradle, or it can be here, and then you can decide, do you want to concentrate all your configuration in one file, or you want to spread them as Maven does in um, um, build descriptors in, an, in each and every module. What else is here? So uh, we also define um, a repository for, um, for dependencies, and of course, Gradle know how to work with Maven uh, format of dependencies, but also with IV format of dependencies or any other custom format of dependencies, as long as you specify the schema where the files should be found, they will, um, they will be found there. Okay? Excellent. So, so I've heard Gradle is a lot about flexibility. Let's see if that project actually builds. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It builds. Let me just make sure that we are on the right branch. Uh, uh, where are my branches? Here they are. I need master. I need master. Where is my master? Yeah, that's my master. Uh. No, I am on master. Okay. So um, you want to build it? Let's build it. Gradle W, clean build. Just enlarge it a little bit. Let's see if it builds. Exactly. Oh, I missed an N, and it still works. And that's another very nice feature of Gradle. Thank you for uh, reminding me. Sometimes those commands and the tasks names become to build. In Gradle, it's enough to provide an unambiguous set of characters that will mean, that will correspond to the right task, and it will just work. So a C won't work, because we have both clean and compile, and check, and classes, and components, at one, and what's not. C L won't work as well, but clean should work like that. Here you go. Excellent. Right. By the way, can you tell me a little bit about this Gradle W? It seems that you're not running the Gradle executable. Yeah, so Gradle W is an interesting feature. Gradle W is called the Gradle wrapper. That's what W comes from. And this Gradle wrapper is a Gradle which is built in inside your project. So here you can see those two executables for Windows and basically for everything else. And what they do is when you run them instead of Gradle installed on your machine, they will download Gradle for you and put it in some caching on your operating system, and it gives you two very important advantages. First, you don't need to install any build tools before you start working with your project. You check out your project from your source control, and you can run the build. It will install Gradle automatically. And also it's very important that it will install the right version of Gradle automatically, right? So Gradle, it's not a very new tool, but it's still young, especially comparing to Maven, and it moves very fast. And sometimes there are breaking changes, as in every uh, software that um, uh, actually being developed. And this wrapper guarantees that the project for which, with which this, uh, the Gradle version with which this project was built, will be actually used every time, right? And then the maintainer of the project, when they decided it's about time to upgrade Gradle, 
they will upgrade it, run it, verify that everything is good, and then have a new wrapper built in. So there is a directory here that's called Gradle, and the Gradle wrapper properties actually controls which Gradle version should be used for this particular project, right? And, and that's, that's, that's cool stuff. That's cool stuff, yeah. And uh, it's, how about how it's, about Maven? It's amazing that it, Gradle has this built in. So Maven doesn't have Maven is an older uh, build tool, right? So Gradle started a little bit later, so they had some lessons prepared for them to learn. So, however, Maven ecosystem is very vast and flexible. There is a thing called Takari uh, Maven wrapper plugin, which does exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah. Why why would Maven even need it? Like. No changes were made in years. Yeah, there are two releases every 10 years. Uh, so when you want to upgrade, probably you don't need to have the consistent version of Maven installed. However, that is possible because it downloads the version that you specify. But you can do a very interesting thing. Typically, you specify some information for Maven in the settings file, right, which sits on your machine somewhere in the home directory .m2. And there is the settings file, which has the links to the repository, some passwords, and everything like that. It's kind of cumbersome to configure that all the time. What you can do with the, with the wrapper, you can bake in this information, this, uh, the settings for that, into your distribution of Maven and provide a link to that. And then when you execute your wrapper, you will get the configuration for that built in. So let me understand something. Um, going back to my build Gradle here, I just specify a repository that needs to be used for dependencies. In Maven, that's not the case, right? You need to um, change the repository from the one that it's nailed down to Maven, which is Maven Central, with your own repository in your settings XML, which are local to your user configuration. Yep. And that means that you need to do it. And if anyone else here in the crowd wants to build your project, they need to change their settings in XML as well. Yes? No? Yes. Yes. How do you like it? Uh, it's uh, pretty normal. It's been normal. It's been like that for ages. Yeah, so, that's, that's a however, good excuse. However, let's not stop on this like, particularly sad moment yeah, no, but, for Maven. But I, mean, but I mean, wrapper actually solves that. Yeah, the Takari wrapper, if you haven't used that, like it's just one Maven command away from your project. You just run it and uh, it enables it and then you check it in and you're much better. And, and this wrapper actually solves this problem because what wrapper allows you is to create a custom Maven version with the settings that you need, with the repository that you uh, want people to use and then wrap it as a Maven executable and make wrapper actually use this version of Maven, which has the correct settings XML. Yep. In general, if you're interested in cool Maven plugins, just a shameless plug, Takari uh, is the company that provides quite a bit of interesting plugins, Polyglot for Maven, and uh, a different lifecycle for Maven, which is uh, easier to configure, simpler, smaller download size. Uh, so if you are using Maven, so just take a look at that. They simplify life a little bit. All right, let's go forward. And what I did here, I installed some dependency. I added some dependency to a library called B. And, and uh, I'll try to run it again. And let's see what's going on now. Whoa, now it fails. It fails. Woo, well, I added the dependency, and suddenly the code fails. How that happened? Well, Anyone have an idea? How adding a dependency make your code fail? Who has an idea? I have an idea. Half of the work of a build tool is to download dependencies and No, come on, no. I believe that someone knows. <laughs> Somebody knows. I know. Nikolai knows. Transitive dependencies. Thank exactly. you, Alex. OK, you earned it. I'll pay you later. Uh, so yeah, transitive dependencies can fail your existing build even without you modifying any of your source code, right? If you rely on a transitive dependency from your package, then adding another transitive dependency can break it. And that's exactly what we, what we have here. It's a wrong window, sorry about that. What we have here is that in one of my, uh, two, my tests here inside lib, I have this test right here, right? Uh, yep. Uh, here, 
It is actually dependent on some package called C, when this package I don't even have. Instead, I have A and B. Both of them bring a C package as a transitive dependency, but they bring different versions, right? Here, I depend on, um, yeah, it was here in the class. Here, I depend on version that has some STR version one. But the new C that came with B actually bring me a wrong one. How can I know it? I can use something like Gradle W dependencies and then for the correct, yep, lib dependencies. I check dependencies for my correct package and I can see here what happened. Here is my compile configuration and I see here that the package named A brings version two of a dependency. And uh, the version two of this, sorry, A brings uh, the dependency C of version one. And then B brings also the same dependency of a different version and it's getting replaced. So version one is getting replaced by version two. What happened? Java identifies a class in a class, in, 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 in a class pass by a fully qualified name. If I have, if I have a class named a string, Java lang string, that's the identification of the class. If I have a dependency to two different packages, in both of them, the class with the same name exists, they cannot coexist in the class pass. One of them will be chosen, and it will be a first one in class pass, which basically means random. In order to prevent that, our build tools resolve those dependencies. They take one of the jars, but not both of them. Now, how do we know which jars should be chosen? We do intelligent guesses. Gradle selects the higher version by default because it assumes that most of the software in the world is backwards compatible, and if one of my dependencies require libc of version one, and the other requires libc of version two, if I take version two, probably the code will still work for when version one is required. Sometimes it's not the case, and that's not the case. What I felt with was and not backwards compatible upper version. How do I fix that? I can fix it very easily by enforcing the right dependency. So here in my build Gradle now, and again, I'm in the wrong window. Here in my build.gradle, I will enforce the configuration of my dependency. And here you can see this code that, let's go to a presentation mode here. So here I say for all the configurations, enforce a new resolution for, for strategy. Force that C will always be from version one, even if some dependency uses version two, right? So that's a very flexible, now this is a closure, it means that I can write any code here. I can say, always take the dependency that starts with letter Z. Never take a dependency which starts with letter C. That's all make a lot of sense, right? But, but you can do that. That's a very flexible and powerful dependency management that solves those conflicts. How Maven is doing in um, sorting out those dependencies? Well, uh, that this problem of the, having the incompatible versions of transitive dependencies is obviously not unique to Gradle. Uh, ah, that was the wrong button. Excellent. Now it's good. So I just, I, I know, I, I can also reproduce this in Maven. So if I add the dependency uh, to the library, and uh, there is a difference though. There is a difference uh, in the details, but I can add a dependency and if it build, pulls in the different version of uh, the library that other dependencies also require, then there will be a conflict. So I just added here a dependency on library called A, 
version 1.0, and let me just show you that this indeed fails the build. With the same, with the same reason, uh, there are classes that are there, but the words are different versions of the classes which are not backwards of words compatible. Now, to analyze the situation, there is a plugin for Maven called Dependency, and this, Maven, this plugin can show you the tree of all the dependencies that you, you are looking at, and it shows you, and it also comes with other goals that you can utilize to, to figure out stuff about your dependencies. Now, on the contrary to the Gradle situation where they have an intelligent decision that libraries are backwards compatible, and so probably it's safe to choose the latest version if, if nothing is forced, Maven behaves a little bit differently, and what it does, it prefers the version that is declared closer to the parent uh, reactor project. So if, if I have... What? Why would... How can someone even know where in your tree of transitive dependencies one of the transitive dependencies is closer or more far away from the root? This is completely... Uh, mistakes were made. <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> this, is, this is the aspect that doesn't... Uh, it surprises me, but... Well, this is what it is. So to overcome the situation, uh, take care of your dependencies, uh, utilize the tree dependency plugin. So how do, you, how do you recover from this situation? How do you force a dependency of a certain version to be used? Uh, that's a good question. Did we rehearse this? Yes. <laughs> so uh, you do it uh, like that. You just put it in your POM file. Yeah. And how it helps with this very strange dependency resolution rule, when you have it in your POM file, you cannot get any closer to the root. You are in the root. So this dependency will always be used, and that's exactly why the whole closer to the root resolution strategy exists. So you can do that and be sure 100% that where you are in the root, you are the closest to the root. And, Elegance, right? And th that may sound, confused, may sound confusing a little bit, but it gave this uh, life to the whole paradigm of the bomb uh, pattern, which is the bill of material, where you use your pattern, par parent file and you declare that as a POM file and you say, M I know my dependencies and I know that th this particular set of dependencies, this combination is sufficient and they will work together well. And you verify that and then you put all that information with the versions in the parent POM file. And then in the modules inside the Erector project, you don't import the dependencies and you don't depend on the particular version of the libraries. But what you just do, you say, I would like to use Google's Guava, right? And the version of Guava that you will take will be taken from the parent POM file. And you import that and then this limitation is overcome. And that is called the BOM pattern, uh, and it is uh, something that is constantly used throughout the industry. For example, the when Spring uh, Cloud... Re Cloud, Boot, all of them. All of them, they, they release the new release, they just say that, okay, now we have a ton of projects, and we know that those versions of those projects work together, so this is our BOM POM. And you just import that, and you immediately get the combination that works for you. And I think this is a very good idea, so you can do exactly the same in Gradle. Um, it is done with external plugin, and there are a couple of plugins that um, do exactly that. One of them is from Spring Framework, just because they needed it to be able to, uh, to run, and the other is from our friend at Netflix. Uh, Nebula Plugins is a great repository with tons of uh, Gradle plugins, and one of them is the Nebula Dependency Recommender plugin, and you can see here that it does exactly the same. The difference is that as everything with Gradle, this is much more flexible than the Maven BOM uh, uh, mechanism, because it can take those recommendations from multiple places, right? For example, it can take it from a properties file. You don't have to have a Maven BOM in order to import them. And then you say, okay, I don't, I don't specify the version here. It should come from recommendation. And here's the list 
of the providers. Maven bomb, of course. That means that you can import Spring Maven bomb or any others, or properties files, or Nebula dependency lock, which is another plugin from Nebula that does exactly that, the recommendations. Also map, or as usual with Gradle, you can just write code that will, that will do that as well. Like okay. it's something that's lacking from our jobs, writing our code you know for what? the build tool. Let's, let's do some crazy stuff. Let's do crazy stuff. Uh, should we enforce something? Yeah, so we spoke about those, uh, those uh, versions and we spoke about that both BOM and the recommendations are actually recommendations. Uh, but uh, sometimes, you know, there are guys that we call, uh, we love them and, and so we call them uh, build Nazis. Right, because um, uh, they they like to enforce things on their development teams, and um, I think sometimes it makes sense. It basically means on the quality of your build, of your engineers and how much do you trust them. If you cannot trust them much, you actually have to enforce stuff of them, right? And and let's show how we do that. So without further ado, since we are out of time, uh, we let's do very quickly. There is a plugin for Maven called Maven Enforcer plugin. What it can do, it can impose some configuration rules on your project. So if the rules will not be met, the project will fail to build. Uh, it will, you just configure that as any plugin in Maven. You just copy paste a bunch of over, uh, XML code from the tutorial or Stack Overflow, and then you some, like, tweak, tweak, tweak that until it satisfies you. So the rules- How many lines of XML? Uh, no, just check it. No, it, do it doesn't require enough. Plenty, so. plenty. I think like uh, 25. Yeah, no, so the things that you can refer, refer, enforce are like a certain version of Java, or you can you know, fail the build on certain platforms of the operating system, or you can ban some plugins from being applied to your build, which is fairly useful when you don't want random people messing with your build system. Or uh, bad versions. If we know that there are some bad versions of dependencies, we can ban them from using. Yes, uh, you, you can. Uh, but fairly, but you can configure that to ban any sort of behavior uh, with uh, a few lines of XML code. So, for example, here I can just say, like, I will also always require Windows to build, and naturally, when I build this stuff, then it will fail. Can you do that in Gradle? Uh, in 25 lines, I'm not sure, because I only need one. So, uh, here we go. That's a groovy code. Take a system property of um, uh, operation system name and then check if it contains Windows. If it doesn't, fail. That's great. I've seen people write Groovy code. Uh, sometimes it leads you into unexpected situations. Can you, uh, and then again, isn't the whole uh, shebang about build tools was that we would like more declarative builds. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and uh, there are problems with this code, and it's not that it is groovy, but it is that we have a custom logic in our uh, build, sc build script, which is, of course, um, a not very appropriate uh, place to have your business logic. And, and of course, this kind of this code should be externalized in a plugin. And uh, um, it definitely can be done in Gradle. So just to show you um, um, an example of how Gradle plugin looks, um, we have here one that goes through the source code and checks whether there are some keywords that you want to define uh, present or, or, or not present for this example. And, that, uh, and that's how the code looks like. Okay, we have a task, we search for content, and then we just find those words, and if they are fine, we issue a warning here. And if we have a flag for fail, we also will fail it. And the, the, the way we apply this plugin is just with one word, apply plugin, and then the name of it. That's wonderful. Plugins also basically is the life of Maven, so you can obviously do the same and create a plugin for Maven as well, if you want to externalize and configure some. That almost looks like XML <laughs> comparing uh, amount of code. What it is, I think it's, it's Java? Is, this is, this ah. is the language called Java. Oh. You spice it up with some annotations. You, the topmost and the one that you need to know for creating Maven plugins is the Mojo, and you specify a couple of properties, and then you basically just write the code as you would do with in usual Java, not as uh, suffice as uh, groovy code, but well, Do we have another hour? Because there is a lot of code here to review. We don't have another hour. 
Uh, but you can do that. And the application, obviously. Yeah, the application. How could I forget? Uh, oh, I think it's uh, let me guess 25, 20 lines of XML. <laughs> let me check. Uh, no, which? Here. Uh, you just add a plugin into your built uh, XML element, and you just do that the, in the configuration over convention over configuration way. You just specify the configuration for a particular execution inside the multiple executions. And you configure that, and it will work, and you specify which go. You know what? And that it's, XML connects to that piece of Java code, and it works flawlessly. It's almost like I knew. It is 20 lines of XML. All right, so with this nice picture here on the screen, I love it that it's here, it's time to vote. So uh, you just applause for one of the tools. And I think we should start with Maven, Obviously. just because you see this beauty here on the screen. So the Maven, uh, hopefully you learned a little bit. Uh, who here liked this side of Maven that we showed here? Excellent. All right, and now let me just bring the other <laughs> code here. Come That's on, guys. Groovy, of course, that has everything. Give it up for Groovy. Right? Right Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I think we can declare a tie here. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you, guys. We don't have any time for questions, but we'll be around, so. And if you have any build tools questions, ping us on we Twitter. Have, we we'll... have the source code for all that in GitHub. So uh, right here, um, you can see the link. Mm -hmm.